um, a full day ahead. So just a reminder for the submitters here, it's 10 minute presentation time. That's including questions from elected members and we'll give a ballot five minutes just to let you know that you're halfway through. And our first uh, submitter we have up after lunch is Richard Gillespie. Welcome Richard. If you would yeah, come to the top of the room here. Seated is fine, and if you could use the speaker in front of you, thank you for the live streaming. Thank you. Uh, I'm a retired engineer, um, been involved in hydraulic engineering most of my life, and my prime reason for being here is that I uh, feel I can contribute to the water supply issues we have. <coughs> uh, in filling out the questionnaire, I have some other answers. I don't know if you have that, those in front of you. Um, but I think the Waterworks one is the one where my expertise comes in, and that's uh, really why I'm here. <coughs> I think it, it's fairly clear to any engineer in the room that the chlorine issue with fresh water is related to leakage and until we correct the leakage we can't dispense with means of sterilizing our water after it comes out of the ground so the whole chlorine argument needs to be put to one side and replaced with a, re a discussion or uh, some action hopefully on um, on dealing with uh, water main leakage um, also, the quality of water uh, in some bores is questionable. I don't have the details, but um, based on what I've heard and what what documentation is is publicly available, so <coughs> uh, that that's that's the primary one I did. There were other issues here that I could speak to. I'm quite happy to take some interjections and, and uh, questions if that suits anybody. So um, <coughs> other than that, uh, my views are probably somewhat conservative with regards to the uh, Tipehinga issue, uh, the uh, housing issues. Uh, likewise, I personally believe that city councils of any size are not welfare agencies. They don't have the funding for it. And so uh, I, b I believe that that should simply be dispensed with um, as a commercial, uh, by all means, a commercial with contractual requirements to do certain things. But I don't believe that we should be bo borrowing millions of dollars to do that. Uh, what else was there? Oh, other feedback item. Um, <coughs> in the house I live in, in Marua, uh, the uh, my own house boundaries are not correctly <coughs> marked on the uh, city council map system. The position of the services within those boundaries is not correctly shown on the city council uh, mapping system. Uh, I would like to suggest that it become an item for uh, urgent attention. I, I'm just one house. I can't be the worst in Napier, and I doubt that I'm the best either. So. And that, that basically sums up what I have, what I would like to say to, to the meeting. Um, and if there's any further questions or explanations anymore, it's quite happy. Thank you very much, Richard. I'll t open up for questions from any councillors. Councillor Brown. Thank you for your submission, Richard. Um, just on the GIS data, um, I suppose there's a number of things that we're not quite um, uh, that aren't quite perfect about council at the moment. And so in terms of us being able to put that on a priority list, what do you think the consequences of that GIS data being um, imperfect are? <coughs> um, essentially, it's, uh, it, from an engineer's perspective, it's efficiency. Mm -hmm. We go to the one drawing which is supposed to be the summary of everything, 
and we find mistakes in it. And we can get misled. We may do days or weeks of work based on that information, and then it comes to trying to do more detail, and all of a sudden, the basis for your original argument is gone. So th th it's very important from, you know, it's, it's an executive level uh, piece of advice that, that needs to be sorted um, much more so, in fact, than um, many other m l more detailed levels. You know, don't need to know the size of the pipe, just need to know that it's actually in my backyard and not in my neighbor's backyard like it is shown on the map. <laughs> I know that because in digging we found it. <coughs> Thank you. There's no further questions. Thank you very much for your time, Richard. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. And next I'd like to invite Debbie Monaghan, Biodiversity Hawke's Bay. And Charles Doherty. Welcome to both of you. <laughs> <laughs> Tanakoto, 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 Katoa. Uh, Madam Mayor, Councillors, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the opportunity to present to you today on behalf of Biodiversity Hawks Bay. I want particularly to acknowledge our General Manager, Debbie Monaghan, who's with me, and, and uh, we're, both of us are representing that organization. The founding of IDEA of Biodiversity Hawks Bay is that uh, a healthy environment is an essential ingredient for the future of Hawks Bay. Nature is our infrastructure. If nature is not healthy, neither are we in terms of wealth, uh, economic wealth, uh, physical, uh, physical health, uh, human well-being. They all depend on, on that infrastructure. Uh, and nature provides these via e what are called ecosystem services, so things that nature does for us <laughs> for free, clean air, clean water, uh, restoration of soils, and, and I could keep going, it's quite a long one, and, and a lot of cultural icons as well. It's simply uh, the quality of our life depends on, on nature, and we're here to work towards a, a nature-rich future for, for the Bay. And as you know, the, 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 the nature in Hawke's Bay is pretty seriously degraded. Eighty-five percent of uh, 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 natural habitats here have been altered, often extremely so, significantly so, into the detriment of us and, and the human environment. And the, the, this is playing out over the next, uh, well, all the r rest of our lives in two really significant international contexts. One is climate change, and we saw how drastic that can be very abruptly last November here, uh, and also a biodiversity crisis. And, and uh, we, we, we will only survive if, if other living organisms do. Uh, the good news is these two crises can be addressed uh, together. They're opposite sides of, of a coin. Our mode of operating is partnership, and uh, these four groups are the ones that we believe are absolutely critical uh, to success, and I think they're, they're um, the ones that are critical to success of your 10-year uh, plans. Uh, we can't restore nature well without uh, these four groups, so we focus quite strongly on engaging with them, with uh, uh, identifying who they are, and there are literally uh, hundreds of them in the Bay, thousands nationally. And that's great news because these are people who, and organizations who are deeply committed to fixing the future. Uh, one of the key factors of, of particularly uh, uh, Tungata Fenua and farmers is they operate over long time frames. They don't operate on the scale of, of, of a three-year election or anything like that. Their view extends much longer than that. And addressing the environmental needs of Hawke's Bay um, it will require us to think in those time, uh, time frames. Uh, we have to, once we understand the role of, of nature in supporting human life and economies, uh, then those time frames become obvious. The good news for us is that uh, there are many, many things we like in your uh, plan. Um, you, you acknowledge quite clearly the effects and, and future uh, we confront it with climate change, and, and thank you for doing so. Uh, we also strongly support 
uh, the development of the Ahariri uh, Regional Park. And, and uh, the, the little short uh, quote there in blue, I'll just read to you because those are the words in the plan. Great parks do great things for communities. The project aims to create a new regional park that promotes better environmental and recreational outcomes for this special place. That's fantastic, thank you. Please press ahead as quickly as you can with that. Uh, a couple of points I'd make about it. One is that uh, at, at, as an international standard that's being adopted across New Zealand, standard for cities to, in terms of their space devoted to natural environments, is about 10% of their available space. Uh, Nap Napier is at about 5% even with this park. So there's lots more work to be done, but that can be advanced in many ways, including corridors that simply connect some of the spaces you already have. So um, th that's fantastic. I think the other context I'd ask you to think about, and it's why uh, uh, we need to think broadly about this, is that parks have many uses. Yes, they're great for nature, but they're also great for people in all sorts of ways, economically, uh, certainly. But uh, if you just simply give a thought to the difference that Hagley Park made for Christchurch in the last decade, uh, both the 2011 earthquake and uh, the, the, the mosque massacres would have played out quite differently for the people there if there had not been those big public spaces for them to, to gather in and so on. So that part, the Ahariri Regional Park is a great initiative and uh, we, we'd love to work with you on that one. Uh, you've invested in us and we thank you very much for that and uh, we'll continue to, to be active partners with you. We very much want to be active partners, not merely to say, pat you on the back and say great job, but to, to say how can we help you and how can we get out messages that often uh, uh, governments can't. So we're quite prepared to be advocates for nature for the benefits that things like the regional park can bring. Uh, I've got the slate, a picture of Belinda Slate up there. She's our new community facilitator. She's well known uh, uh, in Napier. She'd worked uh, for the University of Waikato and jointly with, with the, the council here for uh, much of the last few years and she's now with us courtesy of, of quite a substantial Department of Conservation grant and, and she's taking the lead in directly engaging with these dozens to hundreds of community groups. Now in conclusion, I'd simply again quote, quote you back to yourselves because we think, I think you've got it right and these are taken from uh, uh, the mayor's introductory section there and uh, I, I, I just like, I'm quoting to you because I think it's got, it's on target. It says, for too long, Napier has taken a short-term and conservative view. Uh, I mean, that's correct, and that would be true of most, most cities. Uh, we have a plan. Our goal is to focus on the essentials and invest in the longer term. And you can't solve everything at once. It's taken us uh, the better part of two centuries to uh, do the damage to the environment we've done. It won't come right in, in uh, one government's term. Uh, but if we plan for the longer term, we can fix it. Uh, and, and so to conclude, to achieve the outcomes we all want for our city, it's vital we continue to partner with others to succeed. That's exactly right in our view. We'd like to be one of those partners. So thank you very much for the support you've given us and good luck in working on this plan. Thank you. Thank you very much, mm. Charles and Debbie. And I'll just open up for any questions from councillors. We look forward to working with you as uh, in particular, we move forward with the Ahariri Regional Park. Thank you. Thank you. And I would now welcome Suzanne Chapel to speak to us, please. Welcome. Uh, good afternoon, my name's Susan Chapel, and I'm president of the Hawke's Bay branch of National Council of Women. I'd like to thank you for this opportunity to speak, and I'm speaking here today with the support of Amanda Maino from Heratonga Women's Centre, 
Dorothy Pilkington from Historic Places Hawke's Bay, Kay Morris Matthews from Historic Places Hawke's Bay, mm -hmm. and Barbara Arnott from Historic Places Hawke's Bay. Um, concerning the future of the Memorial Rooms in Memorial Square, Napier. In 2018 and 2020, we presented written and oral submissions to the long-term plan on this issue. Following our submission in 2020, the Council made the following resolution. Council will partner with National Council of Women and Historic Places Hawke's Bay to investigate options for strengthening and returning the women's rest in Clive Square to community use. We were then informed in April 2021 that since this resolution, officers included $1.1 million in its draft long-term plan financials to enable progress to be made on this. However, due to Council's current priorities and affordability, the Council removed this capital funding from the draft plan. In this regard, the resolution to partner with your organisations has needed to be put on hold until such a time as funds become available again. Needless to say, we were very disappointed at the decision. We wanted to stress that the postponement is not what we want, and what we do want is to work with Napier City Council to explore a range of options and work together to resolve this as soon as possible. In April 2020, Heritage New Zealand identified this building and the monument as Category 1. Their report noted that the Women's Rest is notable not only for its architectural and aesthetic value, but its historical significance, <coughs> being highly unusual to have a World War I memorial designed to benefit women. They also noted that it's a key element within the twin squares of Memorial and Clive Square, which include other civic monuments. The Women's Rest Memorial was a practical building sited on Memorial Square with paths linking it to the monument, the practical and the spiritual. The monument and the Women's Rest were not built to be separate entities. The rest has heritage value commemorating both the First World War and women. As reflected by the Council in 1993, when they restored it to commemorate the centenary of women's suffrage, both the rest and the cenotaph in the landscape of Memorial Square reflect New Zealand's powerful social need to honour our dead and remember that women also gave their lives during the war. As I said this earlier, this submission has the support of the Heritonga Women's Centre a service run out of the old Women's Rest Building in Hastings. This is a good example of how an old, unused building, as the Hastings Women's Rest was, can be brought back to life. Their service delivery holds true to the initial purpose and philosophy behind the building of the Women's Rest. We're not talking about reinventing the wheel here. The Heritonga Women's Centre is an excellent model to work with in partnership. Napier City Council has already recognised the worth of the Hastings Centre by donating funds to help Napier women use the facilities during COVID. There is a need in Napier for a women's centre. A women's centre in Memorial Square would put life back into that square. The safety of both Clive and Memorial Square has deteriorated significantly since the closure of the Women's Rest as a community centre. This is an important building and memorial, and it needs practical and sensible strengthening and continued usage as an economically sustainable women's centre. We recognise funding is required for earthquake strengthening and refurbishment. This building is eligible for Lottie's Lotteries, Environmental and Heritage Funding. <coughs> the impost does not have to be all on the ratepayer. The refurbishment is a one-off, and it has been demonstrated that continuing operational costs can be well managed. The Napier City Council are trustees of this memorial, and the building deserves re-establishment to service the needs of the people once again. 
The storage of library books in the Women's Rest does not negate the opportunity for these resources to be stored elsewhere, even other similarly earthquake-prone buildings. Napier women should not be continually without support for the sake of storage. In summary, as was said in our last submission, this building should not be used for the storage of written words, but should be used for the sounds of oral words. Thank you. Anything? <coughs> Thank you, Susan. Uh, do we have any questions from councillors? Councillor Brown. Thank you for your submission. Um, do you know how the lottery's environment and her heritage funding works? Do you know what sort of percentage they would op offer up to? Sorry? Do you know what, um, what proportion of funding that we could possibly be looking to get from the lottery's environment and heritage funding? I believe that the um, organisation that is applying for it does have to commit to um, committing um, about 50%, I think, but I can't swear to that. Okay. Um, but certainly never get 100% funding. There would have to be some um, notion that the organisation is actually uh, committing funds themselves. Thank you. Uh, I'm interested to know in terms of should the centre be restored and used as a woman's rest and you've made comment that um, there's a, a self sort of sustaining um, operational model, would, would that be based off the Hiratonga Women's Centre in Hastings? Would you be looking to collaborate there and... And uh, just to tease that out a little bit more, do you have a variety of different um, funding streams that come through to support the centre? Absolutely. So um, the Hedatonga Women's Centre is funded by a number of philanthropic funding um, funders. We also have a very small contract with the Hastings District Council, but that's probably about 10% of our operational funding. Uh, we also have public facilities in the Hastings building, public toilet facilities, which um, we manage and are available, obviously, to women in that community. So the same. Thank you very much. Councillor Bogue, did I see you? Okay. Any further questions? Thank you all very much for coming today. Thank you. I now invite uh, Claire Plug to uh, come to speak, please. <laughs> so just to let you know, Sheree Kara um, isn't here at the stage, so we're moving forward to Claire Plug. Welcome very much, Claire. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor and... Thank you, councillors, for this opportunity. I've um, given you a handout sheet so you won't forget the things I'm saying. <laughs> I'll just read from this if you'll excuse me. So um, I did focus, I want to focus on the Ahuriri Regional Park proposal um, in particular. So my instant response on reading this proposal was to welcome it. I have a BSc Honours in Ecology and am familiar in theory with the importance of wetlands, how they provide numerous valuable ecosystem services when measured both in dollar and non-monetary terms, much, much more so than, than just a farm paddock would stock. This pro project, like um, Charles, from Biodiversity Hawke's Bay mentioned earlier. This project provides a welcome opportunity to improve Napier's very low level of indigenous vegetative biodiversity. It would help 
Napier towards meeting the proposed national guidelines of 10%. Wetlands also provide habitat and nursery for a diverse range of species, wildlife species, assist in carbon sequestration and have the capacity to retain large volumes of water. To have such a wilderness area so close to our newer suburbs, the opportunity for broad community engagement in its establishment and potential for some form of passive recreation or the general benefits nature confers on residents' well-being all seems very worthwhile. On further consideration, I'm reminded how the devil is in the details, and as yet few details are available to us here. Yes, there is the knowledge in the district now on how to establish and manage a coastal wetland, but those with the practical experience and e expertise not my just 1970s theoretical knowledge, all need to be part of this process. There are DOC, Hawke's Bay Regional Council and Napier City Council staff, as well as numerous individual locals and mana whenua who are intimately familiar with the specifics of this particular estuarine system. They must be all be part of this. The goal of it also functioning as a final stage of stormwater polishing is dependent on numerous factors specific to the site and likely to pose some additional engineering and botanical challenges, particularly, for example, in the light of future climate change, sea level rise, storm events, changes in groundwater and salinity levels but I consider the project is still valuable and very worthy of support, irrespective of the challenges the water treatment aspect of the proposal may incur. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claire. I'll just open up for any questions from councillors. We thank you for your submission uh, and your particular interest in the Ahuriri Regional Park. Thank, thank you, you very much, Claire. And next up we have Pip Thompson from the Napier City Business Inc. Welcome Pip. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, Mayor Wise and councillors. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to present our submission today. Nape City Business Inc. represents 450 businesses and over 2,500 staff within our Nape CBD. This submission is on behalf of the entire membership. Our membership is made up of landlords, retail, business services, hospitality, health, beauty, activities, accommodation, community organisations and inner city living. Napier City Business is, uh, strongly supports the proposed plan to introduce a street management plan, Napier Ambassador Programme that will work in conjunction with the CCTV upgrade in the city. Napier City Business submitted a recommendation on the street management programme to the long term plan back in 2018 and was unsuccessful. Uh, since then, the level of begging, shoplifting and subsequent antisocial behaviour in the Napier CBD has escalated to an unacceptable level and needs urgent attention. Many of our members know from other cities which have implemented the programme successfully that when resourced properly with the right people and training, these programmes can have a significant effect on how safe people feel, crime statistics, intelligence collecting and reduced workload on police. The daily operation of the City Ambassador Programme needs to be available after shop operational hours. City workers, residents and visitors need to feel safe walking the streets in their cars in, during the day and in the evenings. Why we believe the proposed a, um, Ambassador Programme is right for Napier? We all understand that the best way to address unacceptable behaviour in the CBD will be achieved when multiple groups are doing their part to tackle the problem. 
No single entity alone can eliminate the issue. However, all we all working together to do their bit can significantly reduce the impact on victims. These type of programs that operate on the ground and when done properly are known to be successful and is, and is a well-known gap in Napier. A well-resourced, well-trained ambassador program will help close the gap between current social programs and police addressing the two main types of business impact areas. Intimidation. As a shopkeeper, knowing that you can get help within a few minutes from people trained to de-escalate issues will go a long way to providing greater peace of mind for victims, less workload on police and better outcomes for perpetrators. People will feel safer. Shoplifting will be reduced by ambassadors collecting and acting on intelligence gathered on the ground, being present in shoplifting trouble spots to deter shoplifters and feeding back ideas to shopkeepers about staffing and store layouts will lead to the reduction in shoplifting. The presence of begging, shoplifting and antisocial behaviour in Napier CBD has become, noticeably, has become noticeable at the start of January 2017 and has continued. The majority of the offenders are well known to Napier City Council, New Zealand Police and agencies within Hawke's Bay. Napier City Council security patrols commenced mid-2017 by hiring private security guards for 25 hours per week. Retailers currently do not have access to the security guards' contact details unless they ask the security guards directly. They were under-resourced and not necessarily the right model for appropriately dealing with the issues they encountered both in style and in empowerment. Napier City Business is in favour of the long-term plan, security solutions that work for the businesses and public in the CBD. The drop in perception of safety has already been significant and we need to look at reversing this as soon as we can. <coughs> Napier City Business recognises the work that Napier City Council has been doing to work on the above issues. However, we know that there is more that can be done. There needs to be a longer term holistic plan that incorporates all the relevant agencies so that these problems can be resolved from all angles. One of the five outcomes of the mission of Napier City Council is a safe, healthy city that supports community well-being. In particular, it is noted community safety is supported and improved, and social services are supported. To achieve these outcomes, the ongoing issues need to be addressed. Napier City Business Inc. has already invested a lot of time and energy trying to work towards a solution over the years. We are advocates for their businesses and as such can deal with several issues in a single day. This is taking us away from proactive, positive work that we can be doing to enhance the vibrancy of our CBD. What we don't want is for shoppers and visitors to feel so uncomfortable that they decide to shop elsewhere in Hawke's Bay or to the major competitor to, to retailers, which is online shopping. We understand police support the establishment of the Napier City Ambassador Programme. They, they work with the Hastings City Assist daily. Having the middle tier gives both the perpetrators and CBD residents and businesses the support they need to de-escalate most issues. The police cite that the City Assist team can communicate via radio and mobile directly with them. This has ensured where police intervention is required, the right and relevant information and support can be communicated and acted upon. We look forward to hearing the response and the plans to make Napier a safer and enjoyable city to attract all to visit, and especially the plans for the CBD, so we can be assured that business will thrive for us all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pip. Uh, I'll open up for questions. Councillor Tapney. Hey, Pip. Thank you for that, for Carl. Um, just um, be interested in to hear your thoughts around. Are there really some existing templates and information around there around ambassador programs and, and community patrols? But from your perspective and your interaction with businesses in that vicinity, are there any particular features or skills that your network have um, expressed would be valuable or vital in the formation of any of this of a program like the ambassador program? I think from a holistic point of view, um, I think it's really important that we are 
um, supporting our members. Um, sorry, I've completely lost track. <laughs> Track. Can you just repeat that question? Sorry. So, um, given your interaction with with your network, were there any particular skill sets or any particular aspects of an ambassadorial program that they would like to see incorporated as this grows? So, was there anything from our retailers and our com retail community that said, other than people walking the streets mm. and and uh, that type of, were there any other specific features they thought might add value to the concept? I mean, I think that it's important that um, they can deal with it um, with empowering in mind and being kind and and more from a holistic approach on the likelihood of um, them being known in the community as well. Um, and I think that there are organisations that work well with these people and incorporating those people would be important. Thank you very much, Pip. Councillor Simpson. Thanks, Pip. Uh, through you, Madam Chair. Um, just a question around the current policing in the CBD. What's the um, perceived level of presence and their uh, responsiveness and effectiveness in their current activities? Um, they are really high regarded in the CBD. Um, obviously, um, they there are less police on on the streets now particularly within the CBD as they are needing to get out into the community a lot more. Um, I think that um, they are in the CBD as much as they possibly can be. And are they, uh, are they demonstrating effectiveness around resolving some of the problems that have been raised with them? Absolutely, yes. Thank you. I think we just need more support for them. <laughs> Right. Thank you very much for your time today, Pip. Thank you. And next, I would like to welcome Vanessa Moon. Welcome, Vanessa. Thank you. It's a bit scary. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I'm going to read because I'm too nervous to do anything else. Um, I'm here to speak in connection with my written submission in which I recommended that human-induced climate change be included as a foundational issue in the Council's long-term plan for 2021 to 2031. To begin, I would like to acknowledge Mother Earth together with her sun and moon. I do this because I understand through knowledge passed down from my long ago ancestors in the Northern Hemisphere and through other people's ancestors around the world that we human beings, along with all other life on Earth, exist, exist only in, in the context of our dependence on and interconnection with Earth, Sun, Moon and each other. As I see it, a deep and lived understanding of our dependence and interconnection has largely been forgotten by the majority of modern human beings, with I, me, mine dominating over we, us, ours. Those few whose traditions, stories and practices have survived the process of modernisation still live with and by this knowledge as best they can in 2021. Here in Aotearoa, Tangata Whenua have much to teach those of us who are humble and respectful enough to learn. I have opened my oral submission in this way as I see remembering the story of our dependence and in interconnection as fundamental to both understanding how human-induced climate change has come about and from that understanding what needs to happen in order to protect life into the future. This goes beyond reliance on quick te technological fixes, which can have major negative unintended consequences, to actually working within the laws of Earth systems. This will mean making changes to the way we do things under a business-as-usual approach. Since the beginning of language, story has played a very important part in shaping how we humans understand and act in the world. In extremely simplistic terms, it is a focus on the story of independence and separation which has come to dominate the modern narrative, while the story of interdependence and interconnection has been pushed aside. 
This has led to the exploitation of the earth and all her life forms, including of humans by other humans. We are now at the point that life itself is threatened, including our children, grandchildren, and on into the future. This threat makes the rediscovery of the story of we as ours vitally important. As you all know, the threat of climate change has now become a reality as it is already manifesting in devastating ways around the world. Here in Ahurere Napier, we experienced a one day extreme weather event on November the 9th last year, when businesses and homes, including mine, were damaged by flooding and landslips. In the context of what is already happening around the world, this event was very minor. In the context of what the future holds if we don't wake up to the truth of the story of interdependence and interconnectedness and take action accordingly, the, the extreme weather events then would be unimaginable, unimaginable to us now. In a recent written decision in a legal case brought by some young Australians against a proposal by the Australian Minister for the Environment to approve a new coal mine, Justice Mordecai Bromberg wrote the following. It is difficult to characterise in a single phrase the devastation that the plausible evidence presented in this proceeding forecasts for the children. As Australian adults know their country, Australia will be lost and the world as we know it, gone as well. The physical envir environment will be harsher, far more extreme and devastatingly brutal when angry. As for the human experience, quality of life, opportunities to partake in nature's treasures, the capacity to grow and prosper, all will be greatly diminished, lives will be cut short, trauma will be far more common and good health harder to hold and maintain. None of this will be the fault of nature itself. It will largely be inflicted by, this, by the inaction of this generation of adults in what might fairly be described as the greatest intergenerational injustice ever inflicted by one generation of humans upon the next. I acknowledge that climate change is a very difficult reality to face and that councils already have a huge job to do. However, if we are willing to really look and then to work together collaboratively to create a new old story or an old new story, that is, that is one of respect for Earth and our human place within the great web of life, then we will have created the foundation from which to make major changes to the way we live within our communities, design our cities and infrastructure, de develop our economy, make decisions, etc. These latter are all things that local councils have responsibility for managing. And as I indicated in my written submission, my understanding is that all of us who are now adults have a responsibility to use our ability to participate in decision making to ensure that these decisions are focused on the future well-being of the coming generations of humans and the web of life that will support them. We will then be good ancestors, as I put it in my written submission. As a woman, mother, grandmother and human being, I feel this responsi responsibility very deeply. In practical terms, I believe that Napier City Council can and should contribute to an understanding of the story of how human-induced climate change has come about and how we can lessen its impacts. This could be initiated in many ways, including the four that have occurred to me during further research for this oral submission as follows. Firstly, by, asking, by adding a link for climate change to, on the front page of the Council's website so that climate change is acknowledged up front rather than being tucked away in various places on the website and in various documents with often only brief comments. The information that <coughs> this link connects to should be comprehensive, attractively presented and linked to other sources of more in-depth information. Of the few other Council websites that I looked at, I found the information on Environment Canterbury's websi website the most user-friendly. Secondly, by developing a specific climate action framework for Napier in collaboration with the community, the comprehensive and well-presented city vision framework currently on the, the Council's website could provide a benchmark for such a climate change framework. Thirdly, by supporting a process for climate change that is similar to a workshop series called Te Ara or Te Whaki, Community Resilience Indicators. This workshop series recognised the importance of community involvement in civil defence emergencies. A number of people from across different communities within Napier who had been identified as possible community champions were invited to participate. The intention was that these people would then work within their communities 
to engage others in planning for civil defence emergencies. Fourthly, by supporting the local creative community in Napier to engage with the wider community on the issue of climate change via painting, murals, drama, music, street theatre, written and oral story making and telling, etc. Thank you all for listening to my oral submission today. I would like to finish by reading a poem which is included in a book called Thinking Like a Mountain. Oh, my throat. I'm getting very dry, so hang on. <laughs> right. Spirit of love that flows against our flesh, sets it trembling, moves across it as across grass, erasing every boundary that we accept, and swings the doors of our lives wide. This is a prayer I sing, save our perishing earth. Spirit that cracks our single selves, eyes fall down eyes. Hearts escape through the bars of our ribs to, to dart into other bodies. Save this earth. The, earth, the earth is perishing. This is a prayer I sing. Spirit that hears each one of us, hears all that is, listens, listens, hears us out, inspire us now. Our own pulse beats in every stranger's throat and also there within the flowered ground beneath our feet. And teach us to listen. We can hear it in water, in wood, and even in stone. We are earth of this earth, and we are bone of its bone. This is a prayer I sing, for we have forgotten this, and so the earth is perishing. Thank you. Thank you very much for your submission, Vanessa. Um, I'll just open up to the councillors for question. Councillor Bow. Thank you very much, Vanessa, particularly for your very practical suggestions of possible action from us. Um, it is a recurring theme in uh, quite a lot of our submissions, um, the issues that you're raising about climate change and our um, advocacy for action. Um, but I just wanted to ask you what has happened with some other councils, such as the Regional Council, the Hawke's Bay Regional Council and Auckland City Council, yeah. have declared a climate emergency, and I didn't see that as your as one of your suggestions, had you thought about that or was it no, not? No, um, actually I've made, an, unfortunately in some ways this, <coughs> sub, my oral submission doesn't follow, you know, it's not following my written, which was more focused on what the council could do internally. So here I'm focusing more on what, how the um, council could help to, you know, create awareness in the community. Um, yes, and as, I, and as I mentioned, um, can't, uh, there's, there are a number of um, councils who have made climate change more visible on their websites, um, including Canterbury. And I also um, mentioned in my written submission or, or suggested that Napier City Council could join the Mayor's um, Compact of Cities for Climate Change, I think it was called. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yes, yep. so. Mm -hmm. Global yeah. Covenant. Mm. And we're here. Yeah. Sorry, it's the Global Global Covenant of Mayors for Climate and Energy, and currently two other smaller cities, um, New Plymouth and um, Rotorua Lakes District, uh, belong to that, along with our other major cities. And that would provide support and ideas, and and they have a, a, a virtual online conference coming up later this year too, which um, could, called Innovate Cities, I think, which could be a useful thing to be involved in. Thank you very much for your time today, Vanessa. Oh, one question um, quickly from Councillor uh, yeah, Simpson. Will be quick. Um, towards the end of your oral presentation, you <coughs> mentioned a course. Yes. The locations that had been conducted. Yes. Can you just that was cover that, that was um, uh, I was involved in that at the beginning of last year, and it was run by emergency management. Unfortunately, we only had two sessions, and then COVID um, closed everything down. So yeah, that that was a series that was meant. To, I can't remember. I think it was six long or some such so that should be the information should be there somewhere in connection I don't know if that would be on the um, Hawke's Bay Regional Council's website or because I think they're responsible for um, emergency management aren't they and I think I've forgotten the person's name who was running it but I think unfortunately he's no longer here or about to be no longer here but yeah I'm sure there's information about how that could be done thank you okay thank you very much thank you very much Thank you.
We are running slightly ahead of schedule, but I see there's a number of our uh, submitters for the next time block here already. So, um, Tanya, are you, or do you want me to call someone ahead of you and give you a few minutes to collect your thoughts? Okay, that's good as gold. So I think Chris Tremaine, we saw you come in. Are you happy to go now? A little bit earlier than? Great, thank you. Uh, for Cranford Hospice. Welcome, Chris. Thank you, Your Worship. Te hei mori ora, fa te pai tafiti ki tata, fa te pai tata, fa ka moa ki a u ki a tina, a tina koto. Well, kia ora, everybody, and um, yes, Your Worship, councillors, uh, thank you for the opportunity to present today in my role as uh, the chair of the Cranford Foundation. Uh, can I introduce uh, David Compton, uh, who's the uh, uh, voluntary general manager for the foundation? and Janice Byford-Jones, who is our CEO of the Cranford Trust, should be here shortly, but we're obviously uh, up here a bit early, so she may just join us uh, uh, when, she, when she arrives. So yeah, thank you for the opportunity to uh, present today. Uh, I've recently taken over the role from John Buck, who I understand has been in front of this committee uh, or, the, or this council on previous occasions. Here's Janice now. Um, welcome, Janice. <laughs> oh no, we were, we were called a little early, so uh, <laughs> it's fine. Janice is here for any technical questions you might have around the hospice and its activities. She's the general manager of the operational trust. And so that you understand, there are, there are two trusts. There's the Cranford Foundation, uh, which uh, sits there and owns the buildings and the assets of the uh, wider Cranford uh, organisation. And then the Cranford Trust itself is the operational trust, which is responsible for the operational funding of, the, of Cranford on an annual basis. It's about a turnover of some $6 million, 55% um, of which comes from central government and 45% from uh, the community. So the community is already funding some $3 million odd dollars per annum in terms of the funding of the uh, Cranford and the services that we provide in the community. So today it's to talk about uh, the new build uh, at uh, Chester Hope. So just to take you through that and to update you on our progress. So Cranford is, is genuinely for all of us. Uh, on any given day, Cranford touches the lives of over 200 Hawke's Bay husbands and wives, sons and daughters, friends, whanau, uh, neighbours and colleagues. Today we want to update you on the progress of the development at the Chester Hope site. I know that many of you have already been to the site, but it's uh, down Pakafai Road, in past Pakafai School, and we've been gifted six hectares, approximately six hectares of land from the Joan Fernie estate. The, the land is, is quite iconic in that the, the Fernie farm extends both sides of the expressway and uh, to be given a piece of land there which was originally uh, farmed and still continues to be farmed but which had this uh, arboretum and gardens established in 1902 and 1903 by members of uh, Kew Gardens who came out to <coughs> New Zealand and established the property. You'll see from the video that we've uh, recently removed the, uh, the uh, house, which you'll see down the location, just to the, to the left there. Um, so that was a, a big progress, big milestone for us. We obviously worked with the Historic Places Trust and the Archaeological Society to ensure that we followed the right steps and have, but have removed that site to enable us to, to build there. I'll just put this picture in to show you how uh, 
the site sits at the epicentre. There's a side, a picture of Napier and one of Hastings. Uh, so we're pretty much about as central to, to Hawke's Bay uh, a, as you can get. So and I just finished in the video clip with a, uh, a drawdown to the, to the site itself. So I just wanted to update you with the property milestones and where we've got to. So the, the site now has been settled to our, to our asset holding trust, the Cranford um, Foundation. We've completed provisional plans, uh, which have been designed uh, on what was required a couple of years ago now. So uh, these enabled us to proceed to a resource consent. We've been granted that through working closely with the Hastings District Council and the Regional Council, because a number of the uh, issues on the site, obviously water, sewerage, many of those things we're having to actually uh, invest in on site because we don't have the town supply services at the site. Uh, the homestead has now been demolished, which was a significant uh, milestone for us. So we were able to have that, the, the, the decommissioning of that was um, uh, funded by a very, um, a, an excellent donor. Um, but we obviously, as I said earlier, we've done that in association with the, the right channels to make sure that was cleared. We're now working to clear dead and dangerous uh, trees, which have now been removed, and we've got a team of growing volunteers who are transforming the gardens and the arboretum. There's no doubt that this is no small uh, undertaking. It's a, it's a site that has been overgrown for some years <coughs> and will take a number of years to get it back up to, up to speed, but we're, we're confident that it's gonna be an absolute picture uh, once it's completed. We've worked closely with the Joan Fernie uh, Charitable Trust and they've now agreed to the naming of the, the, the gardens themselves as the Joan Fernie Gardens and Arboretum, which will be the home of the new Cranford. There is no plans, no, it will, need, will definitely not be changing the name of Cranford Hospice itself, irrespective of the donors that come through. In terms of fundraising milestones, uh, the project has been quantity surveyed at $15 million, excluding the bridge and roading upgrades. The foundation has set a hurdle target of 10 million in committed funds before we greenlight the project. You'll see there the old uh, bridge, which is we've got already got a donor who's agreed to reinstate that bridge as part of the, the project. In fundraising to date, we've been successful in raising 50% of the funds for the full project. So we've got regional trusts and private donors of, of 2 million. The Hastings District Council originally came in with a two million contribution and amended that to back to uh, 500,000 as a result of the COVID response. I've been in front of that council uh, this morning to, uh, to encourage them to lift their donation, from, or their, their contribution from 500 uh, to two million over four years. But long story short, we're sitting at 7.5 million of, of committed capital. So we're very close to the, the 10 million target that we originally set uh, to greenlight the project. It's only a, a shortfall of 2.5 at the moment. What does green light mean? It means that we'll go back to final plans. We'll go back and, and reinvestigate what's actually needed, what is fit for purpose now, are we configuring with the right number of beds, should we be planning this in stages? So but that's, that's, that's the next step we'll go to before we then uh, proceed to a public campaign. Uh, obviously em employer, project manager and builder and scope the kinds of savings we can get from the community in kind. So we had already significant uh, indications of contribution from, uh, the from, from various building companies who will contribute to the project. Those uh, contributions have not been included in our the fundraising committed that I've, I mentioned earlier. We'll employ our full-time campaign manager and aim to have that uh, underway by spring uh, so that we can start to go out to the wider public because there's indeed an opportunity to involve everybody in this fundraising exercise. This is not just a, a contribution from central uh, or local and central government and other major trusts. We need the public in general to be in love with this site and be you know, um, right behind it. So we'll commence our public campaign then to raise the balance of fund. And also to let you know, we will hold the Knight Street property, which is the current hospice in, uh, in in balance or in reserve for the project so that we believe there's circa one and a half to two million dollars of of capital there which are, you know there's no doubt in building in this environment there'll be there'll be increases and so we need to make sure we have a conservative backstop uh, for those so just in closing our hospice is unique uh, the new cranford will be will be a world-class facility set amongst the joan fernie gardens and arboretum the new a hospice will be a true Hawke's Bay project located equidistant between our, our two beautiful cities. 
we think it's a project like no others, but I guess we're biased. So <laughs> everyone will sit before, before you uh, telling you that today. This is all about family and community, uh, supporting our loved ones at the end of their life's journey. Uh, I can't think of a better thing to, in, to invest in. Uh, we ask your support as a council to help get us to the green light position. Uh, we're asking for a contribution of 2 million or 500,000 over, over four years. So this is all about family and community supporting our loved ones. So thank you so much for the opportunity to present today. I'm determined to, uh, irrespective of where we go and, and how and who, who contributes to get this project uh, across the line for the wider community, for our whanau and families. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris, and I don't think anyone would disagree that this uh, is already an amazing facility here for all of Hawke's Bay, and uh, what you're proposing for the future is something pretty special. So, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'll open up to councillors. Councillor Wright. Good afternoon. Um, my question relates to uh, a comment in your um, submission around the, inc the likely increase of 38% over the next 20 years. Um, which is an additional 26 people needing care per month, yet you're only increasing your facility bed space from eight to 10. Can you please explain the rationale? Yeah, sure, I might get Janice to comment, but just as a, as a general uh, summary, uh, people mm -hmm. are in increasingly wanting to uh, die in their homes. Uh, so our service is, is increasing to support people in home care. We obviously want to increase uh, our, our respite care services, uh, so we are increasing the number, and I think in the next tranche of plans we'll make available the ability to increase that size of that part of the facility as well. But long story short, uh, our gro big growth in our facility uh, and services is in-home care provided by our nurses' outreach into the community. Thank you. So, yeah, I mean, we have actually done projections of numbers that we'd need, and if you think of the actual inpatient part of the hospice, as a bit like IPU, um, uh, sorry, ICU. So people come in and go out again. They need to have some acute care and symptom management. But we've, we're always constantly looking and reviewing that. Thank you. Councillor Tapney. Uh, thank you, through your worship. Um, really exciting, and I'm watching this, uh, this concept gain a foothold in our community, and I've had the privilege of visiting that site. Um, was wondering what your forecasted percentages around community contribution outside of government agencies like ourselves. Yes, yeah, so the target is to get to a 10 million figure of uh, trusts, local government and uh, high net worth individuals. And then our ta once having reached that, full plans, develop the, uh, get the project manager and, and builder on board and then raise the, five, the, the remaining 5 million from the wider community. So we think that'll be in a and lots of different tranches from fifty dollars, you know, to to upwards. So that's a big ask, but we think we can, having got to ten million, we can do that and raise five million out of the community. Okay, thank you very much. Councillor Bogue, yeah, final question. Oh, thanks a lot, um, Chris. Yeah, really good. Um, the question that I've had asked in the community is, all this money for ten beds, maybe five of them from Napier. Um, I must say that I've had personal experience of friends with terminal cancer in the last year, two of them, who the Cranford Hospice staff supported absolutely brilliantly. I have nothing but praise and thanks for them for what they do in the home. But why do we need, you know, 10 beds w way out in the country somewhere, that costing a lot of money, um, if most of your services are provided in the homes? Yeah, so. Uh, why do we need, uh, it's not in terms of way out in the country, it's yeah. halfway between our two cities, so <laughs> I, I, I debate that point. Um, the second point I'd say is that um, much of the respite care, when you have a family member there who's ill and your wide whanau comes and stays on the floor or in, in the family room that we're going to uh, be developing, they want to take that family member out and take them somewhere. This is a facility and a grounds like no other. Yes, I'd accept, I accept that your point around the cost per bed is expensive relative to, say, a hospital, but this is not the kind of care you get in a hospital. And on top of that, it's a much bigger facility than just the beds. This is a place where we house all our, our um, nurses, our, our senior staff, the way that you know, we need to raise $3 million a year. We have some fundraising staff. So there's a, there's a, there's a raft of reasons as to why we need to build it uh, this, as, as large as it is. Okay. We Thanks. also currently can't provide some services that we'd like to because of the um, confines 
of being at, at Knight Street, which has over the years been built on and built on, and is is a residential spaces really. So um, one of the issues that we would like is for this to be an actual community hub. So it's more than just the building. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time today. Thank you very much. Thanks, Chris. I'd like to invite Tanya Eden of Te Tawhinawa o Te Whanganui a Arutu. <coughs> and Hori Reti joining. Great. Kia ora katoa. My name is Tani Eden and I'm the um, Tumu Whakarai o Te Taipunua o Te Whanganui Arutu. I'm the Chief Executive Officer here, uh, there, and joining me today are three of our board members. I have Kahuro from Ngāti Pāro, uh, who is supporting us today, um, from Waiohiki Marae, Marewa from Tangoio Marae, and also Pitane Marae, and also Hoririti, our Chair. Um, also, we have sitting in the audience many of our hapu and marae representatives from Kohu Pātaki, Te Haroto, Tangoio, Pitane, Waiohiki, uh, Motio and Farirangi and Tamikara. Kia ora koutou. And sorry, just for those who have joined us uh, in the last 10, 15 minutes or so, each uh, submitter gets 10 minutes. There'll be about like five minutes to let you know that we're part way through and then two bells after 10 minutes. Yep, I'll race through. <laughs> Uh, kia ora everyone, um, te Taipino o te Whanganui Arotu, we're the mandated iwi authority for Ahuriri Napier. We have representation from our eight marae and twelve hapu, I wish to acknowledge for supporting this submission and who I present on behalf of. I also acknowledge our people uh, who are here today from our board marae and hapu. I'm submitting today as a treaty partner and as a representative of whānau, hapu and te Taipino o te Whanganui Arotu. We are, partner of the, we are partner to Tiriti or Waitangi, this country's founding document. The Taipino have always considered ourselves as a treaty partner and have sought to better build our relationship with Napier City Council, in, particularly, in particular over the last two years and particularly over the last 12 months as we work through the COVID-19 pandemic, the recovery and also the Napier floods. As you know, there's about 10 pages in our submission and I'm going to try and focus on um, some of the key priority areas for us. As I know, we have other whānau who have made submissions and will present in, on other areas um, over today and tomorrow. As a partner to Napier City Council, um, as I said, um, we are always aware of the many issues and uh, policies and plans, I guess, that are at, at play. And we would like to discuss this as a key area around formalising the partnership. Over 12 months ago, after speaking with the Mayor, the Taipino withdrew from the Māori Committee structure of your Council. As we saw the relegation of our role as an operational construct under the Council, this did not recognise us as a treaty partner, and despite a number of attempts to progress this relationship, our Taipino board withdrew our support from the Committee. As stated to the Mayor, we did not see the Committee as representative of mana whenua, and we still do not see that and saw this as a group of community people selected by the Mayor. We've since contacted the Council in writing and expressing a vote of no confidence in the Māori Committee. Going forward, we've made a number of su suggestions, and I see um, in the minutes from last week, um, your Māori Committee meeting, um, that there are uh, proposed a number of changes. So we would like to suggest recognition for mana whenua status of te taipenua o te pānganui arotu. Acknowledging responsibilities to take into account the principles of the treaty and to maintain and improve opportunities for Māori in the Napier um, city area to contrib contribute to local government decision making processes. Enable high aspirations we both hold to Fano, Hapu, Hapuri, Marae, and Iwi. Work collaboratively and deepen the partnership relationship to inform the direction and strategic priorities. 
And as I said, we note the minutes of last week's Māori Committee highlighting a number of transparent changes. This bodes well as all papers put through the committee meeting highlighted that there was a quorum of three people, the Mayor, the representative from Ngāti Pāro and a community representative who our people do not know. Underlying this approach will always be working to include commitments and priorities. We're looking at ways to formalise specific recognition around strategic planning support, areas of culture and heritage, building cultural capability and kaitiakitanga. Alongside formalising the partnership, there's a need to review the current budget and ensure adequate investment into Māori governance, planning and support for the many meetings we are invited to attend, the input we provide in relation to planning, RMA matters, emergency management, community safety, housing, district planning, environmental and tai ao issues. There are many. In fact, I receive phone calls every week and emails every week from council staff um, to provide input into planning. And we want that to continue, but um, we are seeking resourcing for these. So the Taifina wish to request initial grant funding of $750,000 over the next three years with a right of renewal every three years. This would take into consideration two full-time um, FTEs and operational funding to support the current full-time work allocated to planning around three waters, RMA matters, meetings with planners, projects, i.e. the Civic Centre, district plan, annual planning, environmental and tile planning, crime and safety, basically covering the council's four well-beings, which we are a big part of, and growing it, growing it in the areas of economic, environmental, social and cultural. We believe as a taipunua and as demonstrated through COVID-19 and the Napier floods, we can work better in a partnership than constantly having the council ask for input into the many projects required. To us, it's a no-brainer. It's a common sense approach that we work together, but we work together as partners. Through the repeal of the provisions in the Local Electoral Act that related to racist legislation, we believe that a fresh opportunity e existed to make decisions on Māori representation for the 2022 local elections. We believed that your approach to Māori wards was poor, as this had been a long-standing and active issue over the years, and that we are aware the Minister had indicated over four months prior that this change would be coming. Without consultation, you made a unilateral decision which has impacted on the delay in establishing Māori wards until 2025. There's a lot of um, discussion around this and there's a long-standing and live issue, I guess, that the Council should have been able to plan for, consult on and enable. As you know, we did not support this decision and once again, it was not made with input from mana whenua. As mana whenua, we hold a long-term intergenerational approach that would be better supported that we would better support your planning approach and enable the type of partnership that is critical to the success of Napier. To look forward means we must plan for the future. It's important that we remain focused on what the future needs to do um, to, and, and to be, to grow, sustain and build prosperous, healthy, vibrant and culturally strong um, hapu, marae and community. We are here to advocate, grow and ensure strong outcomes for people, our marae and hapu. As part of looking forward, the Māori population continues to grow. And if you as a council do not grow with it, then we have some issues. With over 10,000 more Māori in 2031 in Hawke's Bay as demograph uh, demographic projections. The median age for Māori is 24 and 37 years for all New Zealanders. 89% of Māori know their iwi. And Ngāti Kahungunu, us, we, is the third largest iwi in the country. We have many strategic initiatives. Um, but one of the priorities we wish you to focus on is around papakainga. We know there is a housing crisis. We want you to focus on a papakainga policy that actually looks at helping our people build homes. We recommend that the Napier City Council work with us, work with mana whenua to implement this policy and allow our people to build houses on their land. We suggest that you adopt a policy similar to the Hastings District Council, which is one of the most successful in the country. There are significant gaps in relation to um, resourcing for us, as I've already discussed. Um, Māori partnerships, we would like to request a dedicated budget for improved governance and operation models, operational models, ongoing engagement and the development of strategic plans and other policies. Te Taiao, community development planning, 
uh, dedicated housing plan, dedicated resourcing to understand and give effect to Papa Kainga and manage issues across supply and demand in Napier. Safety and community planning. There's a need to feel safe in our homes and communities. Recently, I attended the um, Napier Pilot City Trust um, uh, uh, children, uh, Unity Day, Unity Day <laughs> yeah. Unity Day for our children, our tamariki, and I was really surprised at the number of children making and young people making submissions around feeling unsafe in our city. So that's a big concern for us. And we want to work with you, the council, to ensure that we can be part of this. <laughs> As part of the funding for the Three Waters, there were specific provisions to improve engagement of Māori in the wider community. This has not enabled us to be engaged. It's unclear who you, are, who you have actually engaged with. <coughs> Excuse me. And there must be an improvement to engagement in this area. In order to progress any of the proposed steps in the three orders, there's a need to hold a formal partnership that considers key information planning and jointly oversees the programme of works for three orders. <coughs> Just moving through them, as I know I'm running out of time, there, there are a number of areas, um, key focus areas in, in the long-term plan. In relation to the water, we agree that more work is needed to ensure sustainable drinking water that can be reviewed and prioritised as part of our partnership. We do not agree with the position that wastewater flows out to sea, given the harm this has created and continue to create more innovation is needed to create alternate methods and approaches that do not harm the environment. We do not support progressing any further investment into three water area into the three waters area until the partnership model is in place. It is recommended by our board that we meet to develop and implement mana whenua, a mana whenua partnership model. As mana whenua, we have not been consulted around the Ahuriri Regional Park. At this stage, we ask for consultation with Mana Whenua and Te Tai Whenua o Te Whanganui Aorotu, and we do not agree to the part going ahead without this. With respect to Te Pihinga, as outlined in the LTP, as Mana Whenua, we have not been consulted on this either. We do not agree to the building of a new facility until further consultation is carried out. I note also in the other submissions, which I've read all of them, um, that Te Ropu a Iwi, Tiwana, Mr Tiwana Aranui and the Marae, Marae Nui Rugby and Sports um, Association is also, is also making submissions and will speak to this. Rather than focus on facilities and how you may create a few short-term jobs when there is already a supply and skill shortage for the construction area, it would be best to invest and enable initiatives that achieve better outcomes, in particular housing. In relation to the housing stock, we would like further um, discussion around that. Um, we note that there, we do not agree with any options as none of the above information is available to review. We also had a suggestion from our board that the Faraday Centre be housed at the Hawke's Bay Museum. One of the areas we've been asked also to speak on in our submission is in relation to our Māori wardens. We, we would recommend that our Māori wardens be engaged and resourced appropriately as part of the street management model and proposal. Finally, our people are not going anywhere. Our families have been here for hundreds of years and we are here to stay. As ratepayers and mana whenua of Ahuriri Napier, we share common goals of community wellbeing, economic, social, cultural and te taiao. We look forward to building an enduring treaty relationship and partnership with the Napier City Council. Nō reira i tukinga ai te whenua nei te whanganui aorotu, te mana i noho i runga i te whānau nei, mai rā no, mai rā no. The mana of the land of te whanganui aorotu has been with our people right from time immemorial. immemorial. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, kia ora koutou katoa. Kia ora. Kia ora, thank you very much, Tanya. Um, we, we are running out of time, but I will open up for a couple of qu quick questions. Councillor Bogue. Um, thank you very much, kia ora. Kia ora, um, Max. Tēnā koutou katoa. Um, because there are a few new things in your oral submission, would we be able to have a copy of 
absolutely of what you to us that would yep. be very helpful thank you very much i'll send that Thank you for uh, coming in today with your time. Um, as always, I re-extend the invitation that I have made several times to several board members to come and meet with you at any time. Um, that, is, that invitation is always there. Thank you, Kirsten. And we've had a number of meetings. Kia ora. Uh, we do just need to clarify, however, that um, components of your submission that were new today, we can't actually accept any new information. Uh, it all has to be in the original submission that was made. It can't be considered as part of deliberations. Kia ora. I'd now like to invite Larry Dallymore. Welcome, Larry. Thank you. You might need to bring the speaker right up. They're not particularly good at. How's that? Good. Yep. Um, I would have liked to have had the uh, occasion to put some slides up there like Chris did for a movie of but probably um, it'll be all photos of erosion that might bore you to tears <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm not uh, going to uh, criticize or um, him comment on the managers uh, management the comments from management because um, really um, I felt that a lot of the issues just weren't addressed but um, I'm not I, uh, the last thing I want to do is criticize uh, management because it gets you nowhere I believe there's um, three issues of concern for NAPA ratepayers, uh, um, which is the basis of my submission and the supplementary information that I provided uh, just in the last few days is uh, just support information for the original submission. Um, I, I believe uh, the council has failed to accept erosion at West Shore Beach is not an act of nature. The significant cause for beach erosion between Harding Road and Bayview is the port shipping channel. The reason um, that I'm not saying it's a, uh, that I'm saying it's not an act of nature and people are being blamed in the 1931 earthquake is that uh, fundamentally it doesn't take 47 years for erosion to show up at the beach in the lee of a port shipping channel that collects the sediment. Um, it, is, uh, it is trapping sand, which is vital replenishment, and the regular deepening and widening uh, um, of the shipping channel means the problem is here to stay, so we have to deal with it. The, count the, the second reason, uh, of, uh, second issue that I have is the councils refuse to recognise the unacceptable high risks for many coastal properties and major city assets in the event of a se severe swell event. I'm possibly one of few uh, looking around uh, that it, um, worked through and experienced the 1974 swell event which was measured at seven metres off the breakwater. Compare that with the 2.4 metre one the other day. Um, I can suggest to you that the, uh, uh, the damage in the north cell, the north littoral cell, is going to be um, um, considerable. We can reasonably expect to read a repeat event to the uh, 1974 event. Um, we're getting um, more uh, cyclones um, that are affecting the, uh, um, the weather systems that are coming down, plus the, the, only the best thing that I can sort out is that the August 74 um, uh, swell event uh, originated from a southern ocean swell and it stayed around just as long as what the last one did. There was something like four days for the one last week and that accounted for the extra damage, I believe. Uh, this was a time back then uh, when Napier beaches were intact and resilient to extreme high seas. And that was a time before the shipping channel 
shipping channel was finished in, in about November 1973, and this storm was in August. So the uh, the effects and the amount of material in the sand delta that had uh, formed across the bay uh, would have had no noticeable effect. In fact, erosion was not discovered till 1976 by members of the uh, West Shore Residents Association, and then again officially by the Napier City Council with council, then Councillor Townsend, um, who recorded, officially recorded that erosion needed attention. It took another nine years before anything was done in 1987, and that's, I've, and I've described it as well as I can in my submission, that the mud and, and fine silt, mainly from the estuary, um, mainly up by the West Shore, opposite the West Shore Hotel in that area, um, was uh, brought in, and that um, caused more problems than than it tried to than it fixed. Um, one of the main problems was living at West Shore was the clouds of dust that came off that mud when it was dry, and ended up in people's houses. Uh, um, I used to, I swept at quite a few. Uh, any councillors that are here that were around in uh, the time I put on some demos at we Shore with um, uh, uh, bottles of sand showing you, uh, showing the councillors back then in uh, 2009, I think it was, uh, what the sand can, have, how good it would be on the beach to give the beach any um, uh, resilience to storms. The third reason is the council has failed to ensure city ratepayers are not held liable either by general rates or targeted rates on, uh, on coastal properties, being liable for the damage caused by others. The Hawke's Bay Regional Council, uh, as owner of the port, or the port company alone is responsible. I'm not gunning for the port. I have a lot of respect for the port. A lot of friends, I had a lot of friends down there as uh, my, work, uh, my place of work. Um, during my time as their preferred contractor and had um, up to 23 men working at a time on, on, the, on the port reclamation, um, sea walls, uh, coastal protection and running the, uh, I had the quarry uh, in Hornsey Road the, the, where the cool store is now, that um, all that land was formed um, after the uh, when the quarry, quarry was finished, the, the cool store was built. We, I can't remember how many cubic metres we took it out of there, but a lot. The council can take some responsibility for the coastal strategy um, uh, uh, stalling after almost eight years. The, the strategy, as I explained in there, with the correspondence from Comar, Professor Comar, um, that the coastal strategy came about because the Napier City Council and the Regional Council refused to answer why beach replenishment with uh, loose stones to replace sand was the best long-term solution for West Shore. It was a disaster then, and it's a disaster now, but as I've always said, it's better than nothing. The, w w when you've got that sort of erosion, you've got two options, hard engineering, which I was told would be the only one because the port back then refused uh, any uh, suggestion that a smaller dredge would be used. They used the Geopodes 5, which drew loaded was um, loaded was 6.8 metres from memory. Uh, the dredges they use now draw 3.8 metres, um, and it would be ideal if we could find a uh, suction dredge a bit smaller so it can get into the southern end where the material is needed. And that would fix the entire bay all the way through to Tongoya. The council can take some responsibility for this. Um, uh, man management has not supported the influence of man-made shipping channel. It has impeded the transport of sediment between the, north, the south cell and the north cell. The, the problems they have in, in the different cells are quite unique and, and uh, fundamentally different to each other. And that's why uh, the, the Coastal Strategy Committee has stalled the way it has. It's gone nowhere, but it is going somewhere now. I um, agree with Rain or Asher QC, who I uh, contacted. Um, Regional Council should take charge of prevention, mitigation and the funding of coastal hazards. 
simply because the, the coast is their problem. They have jurisdiction over the area of the seafloor below mean sea level. So the problem is theirs. What they cannot do is pass the problem onto Napier City Council ratepayers to pay for the problem they created. Now, the Napier ratepayer is going to be paying a contribution through rates to the Regional Council, of course, but the City Council should step back and basically um, uh, insist that the, that the Regional Council and or the port make good the damage that they have caused since the channel that is a vital development at the port, since their channel has caused mayhem for the beach. It's actually destroyed a very good recreational beach, and I've called it an asset, not a project. Um, that is a very important asset for Napier. It was a once very, very popular uh, recreational beach, and it can return to, to that with no more money than what's spent on coastal nourishment every year. We've had meetings with the Dutch dredging company and it's a mere $2.20 extra to pump that sand into where it can actually benefit the beach. And that's by rainbowing or pumping. It just holds the dredge up for a bit, a bit more time, which is the reason for the $2.20. Um, but we don't need to put it all in there. It, it, um, something between 30% and 50% in my estimation would be good but one of the best guys to ask would be uh, Richard in the back there who's from Tonkin and Taylor's he would have, uh, have a better idea but I honestly believe I'm uh, not an engineer um, I'm not a coastal <laughs> scientist uh, I have a lot to do with talking with them um, and I'd really plead with the City Council if they could possibly have a discussion or employ Terry Hume to get involved somehow in uh, what's happening with the future of um, replenishment for West Shore. He was the only one that came up uh, with some solid evidence at the port hearing, which I've uh, produced in my submission. Uh, his, the full copy of his um, uh, response to that hearing, um, I can email it to you because it's, uh, it's about 10 pages and, and I didn't really, once I got to 45 pages for the first one and 64 for the last one, um, I figured that I didn't want to overload uh, councillors. Thank you very much for listening <laughs> and this will be my last submission. <laughs> Thank you very much, Larry. I'll open up to councillors for any questions Kay. they may have. Deputy Mayor Brosnan. Kia ora, Larry. Thank you for coming and speaking to us. I'm consistent. You are. You are. <laughs> um, I just wanted to clarify, I suppose, my understanding of where you've, where you've got to, and, and in particular with the release of Raynor's report. Yes. Yep. Um, and so am I correct, I suppose, in summarising that potentially there's two ways to skin a cat? One would be to, um, as, as you've um, long, long held position of yep. making the port accountable and funding appropriately any remediation. And now with Raynor's report um, if essentially endorsing his um, recommendation, if council was to go that way, we would achieve the same result. Yeah. Uh, look, the port should have an R&M figure on their balance sheet for fixing consequential damage from a vital development that they've got. I understand. Thank you, Larry. And can I just add, if, I, if it's time, uh, Madam Mayor, that uh, I, I presented a submission to the Regional Council. Um, I left plenty of time for questions. I got two questions, one which was irrelevant, and the second one was from um, G Jeriff, um, who was a very good question, and it led to a site visit, and hopefully... Um, I can get some, see some traction from that. Um, I just want a solution. It's, it's sitting there. I, I have had to watch, um, well, others had to watch, I should say, in 1973. 460,000 cubic metres of pure good beach sand was dumped offshore in an outer dump, dump zone where it could not benefit West Shore, Bayview or Tongoya. It was absolute disgrace, and it's been happening since. The port, look, they've tried every every trick, and I don't blame them as a, as a company trying to run a balance sheet, but they have not been a responsible citizen. I don't know whether it's fair for me to say that, but that's how I feel. So let's say I think they are, they are not carrying on like a responsible citizen because they've tried every effort they have to say they're not responsible. 
they have said that they've that they they do take some responsibility, but the um, the gains for the city are more than what, what the losses are. Uh, Garth Cowie would not explain that further, because I couldn't see the the gains for the city. Thank you. Thank you very much, Larry. No further questions. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I thought I might get a cup of tea. <laughs> I'm open to any questions from any councillor at any time. <laughs> any time. There's anything in my submission they don't understand. <laughs> and next, we'd like to invite Graham Duncan for the Ahariri Rock Pools Development Trust. <laughs> Well, for those of you who don't know me, my name's Graham Duncan, and I have with me two colleagues, one in Jonathan Clark, who's with Tonkin Taylor, based in Tauranga, and also Stephen Daish, who's with a, a principal within the Mitchell Daish Partnership. So I'm delighted to have them with me here today. I realise that we are limited in time, so we'll try and move through this presentation rather quickly. Um, circulating to you will be some imagery of a vision of what we're planning as a concept for Napier City of a series of rock pools. There's also a little sample of gold sand that can circulate as well. Um, and again, thank you for the opportunity to make a submission for your long-term plan. And I think the timing is right for this presentation to be made at this stage given a lot of activities in the recent years in Hawke's Bay and the issues over water and beach situations. I'd just like to start by saying that I spent a lot of time in community projects through Rotary International, but I also spent quite a lot of time with my banking finance work, background work and other business activities in Sydney. And I had the experience to take on board some of the major benefits of the Bondi pool project and the benefits that's had in that region of New South Wales. I could see an opportunity to tidy up what I called rather uh, unseemly coastal area in front of the Boardwalk restaurant on the coast there of our Ahari Beach. And I developed some sketch plans initially and drew up some ideas that I progressed over the last two and a half, moving on three years. Just so happened that I ran into Lance Titter, and it's good to see Lance here today. Um, and he alerted me to the fact that way back in 1995, a then councillor, um, gosh, Ivan Wilson, promoted a pool on that shoreline, which was accepted by the account, uh, council, and they got underway to produce a small rock pool. Unfortunately, whilst they had the support of Ian Jack, Sorry, Ian. Dick. Dick. Dick sorry. Mm -hmm. And uh, and Ron Pratt and some of the cadets within Napier. It was after two weeks that he got started, he passed away. Now, that particular project was never resurrected, but I saw that as a golden chalice here, and it gave me the drive to follow this through to be here today to let you see what we are proposing. Um, I think with the PowerPoint presentation now we have, we'll just talk to that very quickly. The Spriggs Park tidal pool that we've mentioned there uh, is a key factor, I think, as part of the overall theme of the redevelopment. And we've got a number of initi initiatives that could build around 
the rock pools program uh, per se. Um, interesting enough too that the Clifton and uh, Tongoya Coastal Panel Report back in 2018, uh, Stephen Dace was very much involved in that develop and for that point likewise with Jonathan here beside me. So um, a lot of work that's been done on the coast looking at the protection and erosion of the coastal area and we see this rock pools development being a big part to give protection to that coastline but also add a wonderful asset for the city. Can I just um, yep. interrupt there? So the community panels um, that looked at the northern panel, um, I facilitated that process, came up with the fact that um, the other area, area will need um, some further seawall protection um, in the short to medium term just to protect all of the facilities and assets there. So this project will basically deliver that sea, sea protection um, as a long-term protection for the whole of our area, area in terms of the, the way it's built. And um, we can perhaps answer some questions of um, Jonathan, who's a coastal engineer from that study as well, on that particular issue. But that's a key, key um, element of this project, which is coastal protection for our area. Thank you. What we have also done is established a new trust for the Ahuviri Rock Pools development, a charitable trust. Um, it's important to note that we have that ready to go to registration. Um, there is provision within that trust to invite two Maori representatives within that trust. And we're very conscious, of course, to make sure the makeup of that trust has got the council representation within that trust. Um, I'd also mention, which is now a legal, a new legal requirement, that I'm working very closely with Peter Twig from Langley Twig. He's been invited and is accepted as a specialist uh, trust, um, the word they use is ad advisor, and I can tell you from Peter's point of view with the Langley Twig legal firm, as he said to me, we are uh, Hariri, and we want to support this project big time. So uh, he's with us all the way on this particular project. The, con the actual concept of this particular set of pools and the development with that area is very much focused on family. Uh, it's a critical factor to look at the community, the wider community here, to give opportunities for family involvement and get the community involved at every single level as we move forward on this. Um, I saw this in Australia, but I also see it here as a major opportunity to invite families within our region, around New Zealand, and there are a lot of developments taking place right at this moment for activity, activities of a similar nature. But it's also the forerunner to establish a very solid base once we get back to some stability when we start bringing back uh, tourists into this region. So there are a number of factors that are going to evolve around this project that will overcome some of the major problems we've had in Hawke's Bay, particularly Napier, for a, a number of years over swimming areas, safety, health and hygiene, and also future proofing. And this project is very much uh, evolved around that. Uh, yeah, the wider concept, I'm, I've just had cataract operations, so I'm not seeing too good. Um, the wider concept here is to really create a theme park and bring in other amenities from within the wider community to develop this area as a safe area for families, as we mentioned, but allowing developments with the Iwi Group. Uh, we've had an invitation to meet with them on the 23rd of July to present a concept there and get buy-in for this. Uh, and look at ways that we can get partnerships with the wider community to get something that's got what I believe is going to be a project that this council, this city, this region can be very proud of. Um, what I've also spent time with is uh, Sam Truebridge regarding the laser uh, high density mist fountain. You've probably seen the one at Oriental Parade in Wellington. That's the responsibility of, of Sam. And I spent some time in Hong Kong not very long ago at the World LED Trade Fair and looked at the new high-tech uh, projectors that can be used. 
and you'll see on our layout sketch plans the position, pardon me, the position of that fountain and we'd have a projector up on the boardwalk restaurant to program a whole range of, of presentations there as a major attraction to, to this region. So the imagery of that will be very sharp with this high new technology. Um, I think the trust focus on the three-way partnership, I'll get Stephen to talk to you with regards to that because we've looked at the mix of how this thing will come together. So if you want to cover that, Stephen. Yeah, certainly um, I'm a consents planner. Um, I understand that getting projects like this across the line is going to be quite a challenge and um, it would require strong interest, support, involvement from Mana Whenua Hapu without a doubt. Um, this is quite an historic area. Uh, Napier City Council is obviously <laughs> absolutely pivotal to the, to the project and um, coming from a community base with the trust that Duncan, um, Graham <coughs> Duncan setting up, um, there's significant um, sponsorship which will sort of come into this project as well. So um, certainly I've been brought on as a, as a planning technical advisor just to sort of work this up to a concept stage <coughs> which we're delivering today. Um, I think I'll perhaps talk to the way forward as well, which is the last slide here. Um, Jonathan has estimated that this project for the pools part of it itself is upwards of $15 million rough order cost. Um, somewhere 10 to 15 is um, Jonathan's estimate. We are, looking we are looking at the classic third, third, third mm -hmm. funding proposal. Um, the trust through sponsorship um, will be looking at putting $5 million into the project. We are looking for Napier City to contribute $5 million in its long-term plan. And we've also got meetings with Stuart Nash and the new Provincial Growth Funds um, people, um, which we have to be invited in to actually contribute to that. So that's looming up in the next couple of weeks. I know Stuart pretty well, as you obviously do as well. So we see this project as being, um, yeah, potentially um, get the government behind it as well. Um, Duncan will, t I'm sorry, Graham will talk a, a little bit more about the significant community benefit to sponsorship he already has secured and it is substantial um, and Jonathan and I put together a project feasibility um, proposal which is with our submission and what we're waiting for at the moment is finalisation of the trust bank account. The trust uh, deed's been finalised, it will be lodged this week for ratification through the MBIE process and really LTC support from the City Council to kick it off. So I think that's our um, presentation and with 10 minutes exactly. <laughs> <laughs> right, I will um, open up just for an opportunity for any questions from councillors. And thank you, very thorough um, submission. Thank you. Councillor Tapney. Um, thank you, through you, Your Worship. Um, tricky question, but seeing as you've got all those brains at the table, you might be just the right people to answer it. Uh, after um, Larry's presentation, a couple of things <laughs> pop into my head. The first is man-made structures along that coast are going to impact on the flow of sediment below the waterline. So I'd like to know um, whether that's been considered. And then the second uh, connected question is, I noticed a jar of golden sand travelling around. And I wonder, is that Hawke's Bay golden sand? If no. not, where's it coming from? And what are the impacts of bringing that sand in, okay. given what we've learnt about the dredging and the previous submitter and the impacts on West Shore? Where, where are we getting confidence from? OK, well, I'll start with the golden sand. I come from the Nelson region. I've been down and spent time down there with regarding sourcing sand. Uh, this sand sample is actually from Separation Point out at Tarkika. Um, the process that we can go through here is getting a sieve sand treated. Uh, there's a thousand ton that we've earmarked as, as a possibility of delivery. We can bring it up through Terakoi cement trucks, uh, cement ship. The cost for that sand, believe it or not, we can have it delivered to our port for 61,500. The gold sand that came from that area and further to Middle March down in central Otago for the Oriental Parade in Wellington, their sand cost $700,000. The quality of the sand is to introduce it as an image 
uh, on our beach that will give you that sort of focus. That's Kai Terry Terry Beach in Nelson, if any of you have been there. There's no way in the world that we want to compromise our quality of our beach here um, and it will be treated on a way that we got some longevity with us. The second thing is that that will be the last part added in uh, to the beach. I'll also state that the sand that's there, it's 375 metres long that beach by 25 metres wide. Some of that will be relocated to uh, West Shore and Larry would be delighted with that. But, um, I think maybe um, yeah. I'll just jump in. We've yeah, good, time. thanks. I think the important thing to realise with this is um, you've got to admire uh, Graham's enthusiasm, and without his drive, none of us would be sat at the table here. He has done a lot of work on the smallest of details and the largest of ones, but this is just a concept. So what we're moving into now is the feasibility study. So it's not going to look exactly like this. It will change. The main concept of two pools will probably stay, but the whole rest of it, will, as part of um, the consenting feasibility study, we will look at moving things around, which will include looking at the coastal processes and how sand's moved. Uh, we've talked about golden sand, but obviously, as Larry's quite keen to tell you earlier, there is other sand <laughs> potentially out there that could be brought in, which would cost more than is $2.20, but that would be part of the development. Um, so everything's kind of up in the air uh, beyond this, but they're all things that can be worked around. And that is the next phase, is the feasibility study to address those issues kind of in detail. I've got a question from Deputy Mayor Brosnan and then from Councillor Price, but we won't have any more because we are starting to run quite a bit behind time. So, Thank you. I think, Jonathan, your question has sort of answered mine, at, I, I suppose, in part. I was really um, thrilled to see that you had some planning advice um, coming with you. Um, I think, Graham, it, it yeah, commend you for the enthusiasm and the concept, I suppose, of for us, that kind of proof of concept for me comes through the feasibility in, in terms of consenting, and it was interesting to hear um, from Stephen around um, potentially linking in with the, the coastal hazard strategy um, in terms of, I presume, finding a gateway um, to the work. So um, just in terms of just teasing out that, that answer, Jonathan, did you have you done any work on consentability? Because obviously that is a hurdle that the coastal hazard strategy is yet to go through in terms of its proposed pathways and for me seems like um, the biggest notwithstanding of course community consultation which is the other um, step in the in the community um, and, and the coastal hazard strategy yeah I think uh, like a lot of people here I've got my battle scars from um, <laughs> consenting things up and down the coast Absolutely. But that might be a better one for Stephen to answer we have done a sort of high level yeah, because it's in the coastal environment it, as I said it is a complex consenting environment we've got Regional Council, Department of Conservation, City Council involved as consenting authorities. Um, I think it's a bit like any of these projects, if we can actually engender the mana whenua support and the community support, um, this is eminently consentable as a package. Um, the community benefits, remember RMA talks about effects plus also positive effects. Um, things like the health benefits for people to be able to you know, soak in salt water, they're well established. Um, you know, my kids are all um, older <coughs> than um, the teenagers now, but um, this certainly, an area like this, um, provide massive recreational family-based um, opportunities that Napier just doesn't have. And um, I think all those factors will weigh to a, a, a good consentability opportunity um, my life has spent consenting very, very difficult projects. Um, this, on the scale of one to ten, is probably a five to six in terms of my experience. With the right, and it's all about the community loving this as a concept, and we've got a fair bit of work to do through the feasibility stage to really um, talk to people about the concept. Take on board, I've said to Graham that, you know, th this concept won't be exactly the same through involvement of people it will move and change and you know i'm pretty confident we can get there um, but we do have to do this solid piece of feasibility work over the next year or so i think before we get going 
Madam Mayor, can I just make one quick comment? I'm very conscious that we now sort of you're nearly hitting okay. 20 minutes time you've had. Um, I will let Councillor Price ask your question. So we've got other yeah, no, that, waiting. That's, that's good so. as well. Just very briefly, you've, um, can you um, give us details on the council's inclusion in this? You've mentioned on the trust and obviously half a million, um, five million dollars. Where else do you see the council on this? Well, I think, as we've said, we've broken it into three sectors for the funding initiatives. This has to be a big involvement with the Council all the way through and the iwi groups. I think it's also fair to say that the work that I've done, I've kept my arms around a pretty tight circle as far as community exposure is concerned, for obvious reasons. But notwithstanding that, there's a lot of city fathers, even as at today, um, are very, very keen to back this financially. One gentleman said he's prepared to give millions towards this project. So I'm trying to lessen the impact on council, but also spread the, the funding volume that is in this pool to do other development around this particular area. So it does need a lot of work done on the feasibility <laughs> study to meet your commentary, which is right, all the steps and processes that we have to go through. But believe me, this is a concept and it's an opportunity to create something that the people of Hawke's Bay and the councils will be proud of. Believe me, it will be that way in the future. You can't swim on Marine Parade. Pandora swims upside down. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Uh, before I call on our next submitter, I just need to make a resolution uh, to extend our time between breaks to over two hours as per standing order 4.2. Do I have a mover and seconder? Moved by Deputy Mayor Brosnan, seconded by Councillor Crown. All those in favour, please say aye. 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 Against, carried. And I would like to invite Robin Quinn. <laughs> Like a sand beach lagoon to me. Welcome, Robin. Good to see you both. Thank you. Um, it's not just me. You've got Margaret, Margaret as well. Yes. <laughs> we both submitted, and um, this is a joint submission. Uh, is this in the right position it's to perfect. be heard? Thank you. Um, thanks for the opportunity. And since we're, we're here in a sort of sports environment, uh, and I happen to be patron of Hawke's Bay Table Tennis, um, can I take the chance to thank your officers for their efforts towards uh, restoring the indoor sports hall at McLean Park and keeping our association informed, which has been much appreciated. Um, our visual aid is rather smaller than the, the one for the last submission. It's this book by David Attenborough. A Life on Our Planet, My Witness Statement and a Vision for the Future, which we've made use of in our submission. And I wonder if you could find page three of our submission and look at that. Um, we wonder what you've made of this book. We assume you've read it. If you haven't, you really should, because it's fundamental to all our futures and actually it's fundamental to whether we even have a future. It's also surprisingly positive. The tables on page three of our submission are based on Attenborough, um, and uh, the book provides his sources, which are impeccable and unassailable. On the left is a column which has to do with the human population on the planet, which you can't do anything about. In the middle, there is a, a column about the amount of carbon in the atmosphere. And you will see a very telling increase, consistent increase over many decades now. And on the right-hand side, there's how much wilderness there is left in the planet. Uh, and you will see a very telling decrease, decade by decade. And those two areas are matters which Council can exercise some influence in and should. Council's long-term plan consultation document does mention 
Climate change, on page four, in relation to impact on our services and reducing greenhouse gases and mitigating its effects. But mention is about it. There's no, there are no clear plans offered. Three councillors here were kind enough to speak with me before we drafted our submission, and I thank them very much for being willing to meet. And I understand that while climate change has come up in your discussions in relation to infrastructure, you haven't really sat down to consider the wider implication and the broader picture. Margaret and I aren't scientists, and we don't pretend any special expertise. But the tables show how extremely urgent is the situation we all face, and we suggest these, there are many areas where Council must have a role and give a lead, and it needs to be coming quickly in the next decade, decade and a half. Council needs to educate itself and all of us, and hence, hence our main specific recommendations. No doubt Council already has plans to deal with rising sea levels and, after the recent floods, more extreme weather events. The two biggest causes of greenhouse gas emissions in New Zealand are methane and petrol-driven road vehicles. Well, we're a fairly confined city, so the methane front's hardly relevant for us. But there may be many things Council could do on the vehicle side. For example, we could be considering the possibility of Taradale and Napier central cities becoming pedestrian, cyclist and public transport areas only with no cars. Whatever we do, we have to do something to make cars less significant in our landscape. I don't know whether you are aware, but the Climate Change Commission's recommendation is that um, traffic transport emissions must fall by 47% by 2035. That's 14 years away. That's a major and very fast change in habits by people and cities. We should be considering how we can work with the Regional Council to develop improved public transport targeted to bring people to work on a regular basis so that they don't need cars. We need to consider Council working with larger businesses and bodies to encourage shared transport. Um, and it may be, of course, that this could be overtaken. I mean, we lived through the 1970s, and if you did too, you may remember that uh, there were years in which we could only use our cars every other day. Given the scale of risk threatening all of us um, and the measured increasing emissions that have been coming out of Hawke's Bay over the last 10, 20 years, um, the reduction should have been a major consideration in the plan, our plan, for the next 10 years. And it isn't. It's not really there. So that's what we've focused on. It seems to us that one obvious way in which Napier City Council can work towards mitigating climate change is through the proposed Ahuriri Regional Park. This could be a really important contribution to improving biodiversity and reducing carbon emissions. And because of that, we've emphasized that any move towards recreational facilities in this plan should be treated with great caution because the really top priorities are to improve water quality and protect the birds from disturbance. Recreational facilities do not mesh well with nesting birds. We um, welcome the work that the Council is doing on improving stormwater um, to protect us, uh, the estuary against um, sewage spillage and also your work with farmers and industries in the area. Um, we do hope that any breaches, any pollution into the estuary will be pursued with vigour because the time for leniency is well and truly over. We want to support Angie Denby's suggestion that this park should be called the Ahuriri Conservation Park because that will make it very clear what its purpose is. And we look forward to the public consultation on the details of the plan when they happen. 
We've argued that the number one priority for the city in, 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 to deal with the next 10 years is to appoint immediately an extra planning officer with specific expertise in climate change and in how it might affect town planning and investigate alternative plans for our future because Napier in 20 years time is not going to be and cannot be the way Napier is now. The changes that are on us are, have, should have been dealt with 15 years ago and weren't, should have been dealt with five years ago and weren't, and we are running out of time. We've run out of time. We suggest that the cost of this officer should be halved because it would make sense if it was a half share with Hastings, which will face the same problems. The regional council has appointed, or is appointing, an ambassador for climate change. It won't deal, that ambassador won't deal with urban planning. If, if the cities <coughs> adopt a joint climate planner, that would work very well with the Regional Council's climate ambassador. We believe the appointment for which we are calling is essential and urgent if we want to be able to plan for the future with any sort of confidence. <coughs> we think it will help us mesh with the major changes which are envisaged by the government's climate change report. We think we will have in the next 10 years to respond much more promptly than Council will be happy with to um, developments that are uh, speeding up. We think it will allow us to explore what different scenarios might mean for Napier's future. Um, and I think I'll stop there and invite questions. Thank you. I'll open up for questions from councillors. Uh, as always, a very thorough submission from both of you. Thank you, Margaret and Robin. No questions. <laughs> no questions. <laughs> Perhaps if I've got half a minute in that case on the subject, can I add uh, um, to what I've said? Um, Hamilton, for instance, has produced a, and developed a concept of a 15... Um, minute city, by which they mean, was it 20, 15 to 20 anyway, which means that all the necessities for living are within that space and available to people on foot or on bicycle <coughs> or by public transport. Has Napier started thinking along those lines? If it hasn't, it needs to. Uh, mm. Auckland has declared a, a, a climate emergency. Have we? Have we considered it? Clearly climate is important in Hawke's Bay in general important for us. Um. Thank you, Robin. I'd not, um, now like to invite up Gordon Anderson, please. Welcome, Gordon. Thank you. <laughs> Afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I come, home, come here as a, a ratepayer from the suburb of Puramai, but also as a member of the PRA, the group that uh, very active <laughs> within, it, within that. I'm a believer that not bringing a problem, but bring a, bringing a solution to most things, and, that, and that's how I try to work. As we all know, in November we had a, a downpour. It just so happened that I was sitting in the neighbour city council at the time when it occurred and uh, just about had to row home as well. But my submission's about a, a simple, a, as a, which I believe is a simple solution to a problem. The problem is this, that Puramai is the sump of Napier. Puramai is the floodplain, the catchment area, if nothing else is working out towards the sea. The issue is that the, with all that flooding that uh, went on, there are still people out there in our community who, uh, as of a month ago, are living in Council Park, people who cannot get their um, kitchens fixed, their 
uh, garages fixed, etc., in their homes simply because they can't get the tradesmen to fix it, all due to pumping, all due to the, the, the flood. My proposal is simply this. We have a cross-country drain running right next door to, to the suburb. But the issue is, apart from an overflow drain which runs behind my home in McNaughton Place, there is no exit point from Harold Holt Avenue into that drain. And as someone said, I'd like to take the lead, someone from our group once said, would you build a motorway without an on-ramp? There is no entry point. And as a consequence, a lot of the houses, those who dared to venture out with the vehicles at the time would have found the depth of that, that particular water. When the cross-country drain was built in 2005, I was informed that it was mooted that there would be a pump to be able to take water to, from, from the top of Harold Holt Avenue to protect half a dozen houses up there. But my point today is that what I'd like to see this council do is part of its uh, water scheme the freshwater um, mitigation scheme is to install a pumping system on the boom area of Harold Holt in order to be able to take the water directly out of the Harold Holt area, the Purimai area, into that cross country drain. Now, that particular drain has a few problems within itself, and that is, is the lack of automation of the pumps down in Tiawa Avenue. Now I sat, sorry, I stood in my bedroom window and watched the water rising. Now I have a drain behind my place which is approximately just over three metres deep and I saw that water coming. And it finished, stopped flowing about, um, about 12 inches, 300 from the top of that drain. And yet there are other places in Purimai which were flooded because our, our land is, has been raised for that subdivision by about 300 millimetres. If it hadn't, we would have been flooding flooded out. So I, I ask you with urgency, as part of the budget that's going to be foot, put uh, forward for future planning for the freshwater mitigation scheme, is to install that pump. Have it on a switch, uh, switch system, but have it, have it installed that it's automated towards those pumps. There are, at the end, behind McNaughton Place, a signal tower. We were informed that the signal, when that water level rose, went to Palmerston North and then had to come back to Napier. What's going on? So it, I believe that's in, that should be overhauled and so at some stage the water comes up, something signal. Now I understand about those particular pumps, how they work and whether they work properly or not, I'm not too sure. But my uh, presence here today is to ask this council on behalf of all the, the residents of Puramai to seriously consider doing that. And one very important reason, well, two important reasons. One, the demographics of the people in Puramai are changing. We've got a lot of young couples coming into that area, a lot of older couples, a lot of older people moving out into retirement villages. Hence, they're bringing young children and, of course, they're making babies. But the other aspect of it, too, is that I have a neighbour whose insurance policies have just risen $500 simply because they're now included into the Puramai area for that where they live in, in McNaughton. So if we're getting going to get knocked with those kind of increases, these young couples coming in who would have taken mortgages up, who will be, be struggling in their start-up, as many of us in this room will know, do not want that kind of problem to occur. So let's put a pump on that boom area, at Harold Holt area, to take the water across into that drain so it can be dis dispelled out onto the beach. Thank you. Thank you, Gordon. Are there any questions for Gordon? Good. Thank you. Thank you for your submission. And next we have Mark Cleary from the Napier Pilot City Trust. Welcome, Mark. Thank you, Kirsten. 
Namihi Kia Koto, Your Worship and Councillors, thanks very much for the opportunity to speak to our submission. Um, quality democratic processes are important and foster rich form of citizenship and civic engagement, which as you know is from the Local Government Act of 2001. Um, First, I'd also like to apologise on Joan's behalf. She's, as a former nurse, she's been drawn back into the vaccination programme and is jabbing people as we speak. <laughs> um, so since, since our trust was formed in the 1980s, and I'm sure you all know from Pat's submissions exactly all about that, um, we've been motivated to make Napier a kinder and fairer place that is vibrant, engaged and inclusive. Or as you say, the best city in New Zealand in which to live, work, raise a family and enjoy a safe and satisfying life. In our submission to the long-term plan, we want to focus on the urgent and currently unmet need to engage with our communities so that they develop the confidence to participate in local decision-making to meet the current and future needs of our city. So we're commenting mainly on community safety and in particular street management and we'll make some comments on places and spaces particular about Tipihina and housing. Uh, we want a greater emphasis on putting people first. Uh, so once again we ask the Council to prioritise and to allocate long term and sustainable resource to reducing inequity with an, emphasize, in, in, sorry, with an emphasis on providing greater meaning for tamariki in our community through the development of a child and young person strategy aimed at making Napier child friendly. We welcome the acknowledgement that since 2015 there has been an ongoing escalation of antisocial behaviour in the city. This has been mirrored by an increase in homelessness and eye-boggling rises in rents, the cost of housing, and we see rents being linked to landlord mortgage repayments and making them increasingly unaffordable. While it was central government that is behind the rapid increase in population across the nation, it's interesting that in 2006 the Department of Statistics predicted that we'd reach 5 million people in 2050. As you know, we reached that figure last year. What's been our local response? In the face of these challenges, we ask that the Council is proactive in your response. We know the current social deprivation statistics for Napier are poor, and this is resulting in increased, in increased economic and social hardship with the inevitable rise in drug use, gang membership and crime. So <clears throat> our specific recommendations for you to consider. <coughs> so we call on for the development and implementation of a well-resourced child and young persons plan that will help all our rangatahi, rangatahi and tamariki, not only those already disaffected, but those who may become disaffected, but also all the citizens of Napier. Um, it was interesting, Tanya mentioned the Child Friendly Forums. We've hosted two over the last two years. And I th I'd recommend all councillors listen to what they were saying. They did, our young people don't feel that safe in Napier, and we need to work out how we can make them feel safer. Secondly, we support the intent behind the Ambassador Plan but call for an, an, a significant enhancement of the scope of the program. We'd like this program to work in close partnership with the Neighbourhood Support Program, which incidentally was brought to Napier by the Pilot City Trust. This could have a kaupapa of community engagement that must be central to the success of any sustainable plan to improve the social wellbeing of Napier. We see a real gap in engagement with our communities. Thirdly, with Te Pihina, we would like to see this project redesigned and staged more carefully with a much greater input from residents. Dominus Levi Armstrong has clearly demonstrated the impact people-focused projects can have with minimal capital expenditure. Levi was one of our um, awardees at the Unity Day this year. We think the Council should immediately provide spaces for community gatherings and existing shop spaces. This could be complemented by high quality programs such as Levi's, the community centre building could be paused and co-designed with the community as programmes and needs evolve and drive development. Any investment in Marae Nui needs to have significant employment component so that there is ongoing support for people who will build resilience from within the suburb. 
and finally housing. The Pilot City Trust strongly supports the retention of current housing stock and would also support a much greater emphasis of the involvement of the Council in facilitating the building of affordable housing. So in summary, our submission asks the Council to allocate sufficient and sustainable funding in, a long, in, in the long term plans to foster community engagement and advance any projects that come out of such consultation that target reducing inequity and provide meaning for our young people. These will result in a kinder and fairer child-friendly city. And that's it. Thank you, Mark. I'll open up for any questions. Councillor Bogue. Kia ora, Mark. Thank you. Thank you, Pilot City Trust. Um, in previous years, Mark, you've asked for a child-friendly city and the status of that. There are examples of that, I understand, um, in other parts of New Zealand. But this year, you're asking for a child and young person plan. Uh, what's the difference? Are there any examples of it anywhere? No, I, I think it's quite clear that, that we need to co-design and evolve a plan and a strategy involving our community. Um, the UNICEF model um, hasn't been that sustainable, which is a, um, you know, a cookie cutter sort of approach where you bring in a, a plan from somewhere else. We're, we're actually arguing that we should build our own. I, I'd have to say, however, it would be sensible if we looked at the child and youth strategy that the, the government is currently promoting from the Prime Minister's office and if we piggyback with that as well, but developed Napier's unique version that would be much better. And while I'm here too, I'd just like to thank the Council for their ongoing support about the Trust activities. We have no money, um, but we're able to, with your support, put together a couple of good events every year that are, are pretty well supported. There's no further questions. Thank you very much, Mark. Thanks, Kirsten. And I'd like to invite up Chris Lambourne, please. Welcome, Chris. Thank you. Uh, um, uh, Tenakoto, 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 Kata. Uh, thank you, Your Worship and councillors, for giving me the opportunity to talk today uh, and make a submission. Um, I'm Chris Lambourne, and um, I'm doing, making this submission on behalf of Monarchy Energy. I am the Commissioner of Monarchy Energy. Um, so, Monarchy Energy was formed to address the issue of power, poverty in New Zealand. And, um, and one s small step in this journey that Monarchy Energy is making is that we're in the process of installing uh, free solar power PV panels, uh, PV, uh, panels on uh, 50 Māori homes. Now, it's a small step, but it's costing uh, $400,000. So in 2019, the Government's Electricity Price Review um, Commission found that in excess of 100,000 homes in New Zealand faced power poverty. Now the impact of power poverty is numerous, and you've got cold houses, you know, power gets turned off, and you get increased rates of illness, and the list goes on. Um, the brands in the Auckland uh, University are running longitudinal studies currently, and earlier this month reported back that, that half of the 2,000 children that, um, that are in that study um, are sleeping in rooms that are too cold, and that has that impact on increased illness, increased respiratory issues. Last month, um, Radio New Zealand highlighted another study, another university study, that found that one in six houses were not receiving quality utilities. You know, this is covering the drinking water, the sewerage, the phone, the internet, and of course, power. So in, in 2018, the Productivity Commission found that the electricity prices have been rising on, at an annual average rate of 2.5% above the rate of inflation. So over the last 30 years, the compounding effect of that 2.5% has is, is effectively seen the doubling of prices in real terms, and then add inflation. 
And the Productivity Commission is forecasting that electricity prices will continue increasing at this 2.5% rate um, for at least the next 30 years. So you know, by 2050, again, we'll see a doubling of the rate of the cost of power. So throughout New Zealand, we start with $100,000, uh, sorry, 100,000 um, homes being in power poverty, and then we double the price of electricity over 30 years, and what do you think the um, levels of power poverty are going to be then? Is it 200,000, is it 300,000 homes? And so what we see is that in New Zealand, we're on the, the cusp of developing a problem as large as today's housing crisis. Now, from the, uh, the council's perspective, this intersects with you in, in, in two ways. And, and firstly, as a territorial authority, you, know, you have this requirement of delivering well-being for the people living in your territory. And increasing levels of power poverty go directly against that, that social well-being. And, and the second area which is going to impact you, which is going to impact in your pockets, is that the increasing electricity costs um, hit the council's budgets. You know, the council is one of the largest electricity consumers in the area. And it's, if not the largest, every street light, every traffic light, every drainage pump, um, and every new drainage pump, um, every sewage pump requires electricity. And um, what we're asking is that the Napier, Napier City Council consider how its long-term plan positions itself um, to increase the well-being of those facing power poverty, and also to control its own energy costs. Now we submit that the um, Napier City Council should make renewable energy um, <laughs> generation a permitted activity. Now this is what Hastings do, this is what quite a few other councils do. And secondly, it should take uh, steps to use its assets and market presence um, to develop renewable energy generation as a way of controlling its own costs and um, its own electricity requirements. And then thirdly, it should take steps to use its assets and market presence um, to develop renewable electricity generation as a way of influencing the energy costs of those facing power poverty. So um, I'd like to thank you for giving me this opportunity. And, um, and wish you well in your deliberations. Thank you very much, Chris. Are there any questions from councillors? Councillor Bogue. Hi, Chris. Um, some of the suggestions you made, I don't think we have in your original um, submission, some of the things you read it. I was wondering if you could circulate that or email it to some of the team who are. We'll do. Uh, um, I have a copy here for oh, your offices. You. Bearing in mind we can't consider any new information that's uh, being presented. There's, yeah. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for your time, Chris. Thank you. And I'd like to invite Forbes Neal, please. Welcome, Forbes. Tēnā koutou katoa. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to the council today. I'm a relative newcomer to Napier, but I come from Tamakuma Kaurau, where I've had 50 years in resource management. And I, four years ago, I moved to Napier and this is the first time I've been on this side of the, the table because in Auckland, of course, I was part of the council. Now, you have my general submission 
in pretty well every case, I supported the, the emphasis that you had placed on each topic. And I was very interested today to hear some of the other submitters, uh, particularly with the emphasis on disposal of stormwater, because my property and my neighbours' properties suffered greatly in the great flood of November 2020. Uh, we're still getting, uh, having clean-up methods and issues in that. Uh, I do happen to live in Pirimai, like the previous submitter. Obviously, there's a great need to protect the environment and with climate change uh, on its way. I think the protection of the Ahuriri Lagoon is vital, and I noted that in my own submission. The disposal of wastewater, of course it becomes a problem in when the stormwater floods because the wastewater gets into the stormwater and then you have widespread pollution. So I would certainly ask the council to take all possible steps to minimise the pollution of the environment. And the previous submitter who suggested a, a further pumping station in Pirimai, uh, something I hadn't thought of, but the flooding, the flooding was so bad I couldn't get out and about, and I didn't see where the existing drains, whether they were working or not. And I suspect they weren't because the, uh, my whole property was flooded and uh, my neighbours' cars were lost, damaged beyond repair in the floods. And I think too that I was a little little concern today about the I appreciate other submitters wanting to have coastal improvements and swimming pools and safe swimming but I do feel that the environment and water safety as far as pollution goes are far more important issues and I think with that, I will conclude my submission, and thank you. Thank you very much. I'll just see if there's any questions from councillors. All right. No, okay. there's not. So thank you very much for your time today. Okay, thank you. Okay. We have one final submitter before uh, we've got a break, and that's Isabella Nichols. <coughs> Welcome, Isabella. Thank you. <laughs> Kia ora. My name is Isabella Nichols, and I'm here to tell you about my idea. My youth program is to make people feel like they are part of something and to help the community. <laughs> my idea is for a program, a reward program for work, done certificates as rewards to boost self-esteem and to show future employers unpaid community work and after-school activities. These are benefits for you guys. I'm getting youth off the streets. It's made for all ages, free to come, free work done for the council, benefiting youths for mental health, good free education of the real world, helping Napier look beautiful again. Youth appreciate their city less, tagging and vandalism, etc. How these ideas came about is that I'm a youth that doesn't fit into the normal school curriculum. I have sleep apnea and scoliosis, so sports can be hard at times, but I still try my best in education. My sleep apnea gives me temporary memory loss. I would like to be a youth representative for Napier and have a program that can help youth like me that don't fit in. 
to the world. It's okay to be different. I would like to show youths no matter what obstacles they have in life they can achieve and build self-esteem by giving back to the community. I'm willing to help in any way possible with this program. I have support from my parents. Thank you for your time. I'm looking forward to your feedback. Thank you very much, Isabella. Thank or you. I think it's Izzy, isn't it? That oh, you go just by. anyone really. Either one. Either one. <laughs> uh, thank you for coming to talk to us today. Thank and uh, I think that there's definitely merit in what you've put in your submission. I'll just open up and see if any of the councillors have got any questions for you. And I know that we have been in touch uh, to see if you'd be keen to be involved in a youth um, planning project that we're doing. So we're I'm looking always. forward to having you involved in that. I'm always keen on stuff like this. Excellent. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming to Thank talk you, to us. Uh, now, we do actually have a, a longer break now. Uh, we don't have any other submitters scheduled till five, so there'll be some afternoon tea and then...